It's beautiful to have to come behind sweet music, sweet song that lines up with our scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We're going to finish out chapter number 15 and we're going to speak and teach about what you just sung about. How great thou art. We'll sing about the resurrection. Well, yeah, that's what we did. Now we're going to teach about it and look at what it what it means that, uh, as it says at the end of chapter number 15 in your scriptures and, and uh, verse number 55, 56, that death doesn't have any sting. Death has no victory. The grave doesn't have victory, no sting, no, no trap. We're not held captive believers in Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is real, and so we have preached through a bunch of verses up to page, I mean, to verse number 34 in, uh, in your Bible in chapter number 15, and so I want you to, to really focus in on per- verses 35 through the end of the chapter and where we're at today because it is really a part of, uh, of course, our study and how we're finishing up our study in 1 Corinthians, but really off of what we just sung about and so very, very thankful. Uh, up on the screen, I have a couple of things I just want to highlight. Uh, every once in a while I do that. Uh, VBSC, uh, it's on its way. There's a woohoo! There you go. Our camp for the summer, Vacation Bible Sports Camp. Uh, as I often say, kids do not like to go to school as much as they love to go to camp. So then, you know, you say, okay, well, then it's Vacation Bible Sports Camp. And, and so we're looking forward to this year, 2023. I believe it brings our sixth camp. We are having an involvement meeting next Sunday, right after second service, right here in the auditorium. So please, if you would like to be involved, you have some questions about what it means to be involved, you just say, hey, I'm in 100%. That's fine. If you're kind of wavering, wondering what you should or shouldn't do, Please come to that meeting if you can during this week. Usually about midweek when it comes to something like this, I'll send out an email. I sent one out this past Wednesday about our our family conference, which I'll talk about in a minute. Open up your email. Check your email. If you're on the platform of our church's email, really that is my email address that goes out to all of you collectively and corporately. Please check your email and see uh, if you missed something this past week, but I will send something out again this week. It will have a little button that you can click to say, hey, I would like to engage the mission. I want to be involved. Uh, it won't be anything that predicates whether you should or shouldn't be at the meeting. If you can come to the VBSC involvement meeting, please come. You'll hear from our children's ministry director, Pam Snow, about where we're headed this year. And you will hear from our regional missions director, Pastor Brian Calloway, about really the layout of things. We won't take long. It won't take very many minutes, maybe about two or three hours. We'll be serving lunch. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. It'll be 15 minutes at the most, maybe 10 to 12 minutes if you uh, bribe the children's ministry director. Um, Now, regional missions guy, sometimes even bribery doesn't help. But, uh, But we'll cover the things that are important get you some things in your hands, and get you ready to go. Another thing that is coming up, it's in two weekends, is our family conference. We we did something really neat last year around this time of the year. We celebrated our 25th anniversary. We're headed into our 26th and laying some things out coming into this year. I looked at it and thought, what if we could um, put something in this spot that would be helpful, effective, and by the word of God and by the spirit of God, really be an add to our ministry to make us better off of, of course, our Acts 1-8 conference last year in Christ alone. Well, our family conference. We haven't done something like this. We've done some marriage things and some relationships things, and we've taught on raising children at different times. Well, this is a combo package for the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in two weeks. It'll be the weekend of May 5th, 6th, and 7th. I do believe I've got the dates right there. And we will have Pastor Kevin Pesky from uh, First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester coming to to preach and speak to us. 
How does this lay out? Very simply, Friday night is for everyone that would like to come, although it is highlighting uh, relationships in all in generality, which would be very simply uh, boys and girls thinking about dating, considering dating. I've talked to our youth pastor uh, about having maybe some of the uh, teenagers come and maybe invite their mom or dad if they are in a relationship or considering what I should do. How do I uh, date someone, to court someone, young single people, older single people? It'll be all put upon that. Also, too, anyone can come for Friday night. We're going to have dessert and we're going to have uh, drinks. It'll be at 6 30. You could read your email again that I sent Wednesday. You would see that information will be in the fellowship hall for Friday night. And again, it's about relationships, how to love one another the right way, especially if you're deciding that, hey, I'd like to get married someday or I'm considering, uh, yeah, make sure you do that. Saturday evening is a restricted place for married couples only. Bottom right-hand corner, married couples dinner. We have room for all of you married couples, so make sure that you sign up for that. If you are a married couple, it is going to be strategically preaching and teaching on having a better marriage, doing marriage well. And we would like to make sure that as many married couples that can come, we're going to have dinner in the fellowship hall, and then, of course, Pastor Kevin will be speaking to us. And then Sunday morning, off of that, Friday night and Saturday, Sunday morning, of course, is for everyone. Pastor Kevin will be preaching here on Sunday morning, and he'll be speaking about children, raising children, what it takes to raise children properly, biblically. They are a heritage of the Lord. And so even as the church, maybe you don't have any children, but you'd love to maybe know a little bit about what it takes to raise children and do a, a, do a great job at that, do a better job than you're already doing. Grandma, grandpa, uncles, aunts, whatever, and your influence in children, please, please put aside next Sunday, I mean two Sundays from now. So, of course, Friday night, relationships, dating, any kind of relationship like that, doing that well, Saturday evening, uh, married couples, and then Sunday morning, children. So we're looking at all three aspects of the family and how we can improve, be healthier, and be better in the body of Christ. Love others is the theme, of course. Uh, we live faith, decla uh, declare hope is the last one, but we love others, and we've been speaking about that in our series right now, Love Never Fails. So I know that you're in your, your Bibles opened up, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Let's get into our text this morning and look at, uh, this is our next to last message. We're going to be uh, looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 next week. You say, can we cover all that ground? Well, 16 is a sweet beautiful, practical type of passage of 24 verses, and there's a lot of practical teaching there, but this is still in the place of doctrinal teaching as we're finishing up chapter number 15. Last week, our title of our message was, In the End, Meaningless, speaking of how someone who uh, doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and doesn't believe in the resurrection of Christ at the end of life, it will be meaningless. Their life has been purposeless. It's been void and it has been empty. And that's how we looked at the verses that came at us from uh, chapter number 15. All the way down, we went to verse number 34. Well, today we're going to pick it up and look at that resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it applies to you and me. Because, again... The Bible teaches clearly about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus Christ said himself in 1 John chapter number 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he adds this great question, simple, three words. Believest thou this? This morning do you believe this? Do you believe it as maybe? That sounds like a good thought. I've heard some religious teaching over the years. I've been in and out of church. They said that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Yeah, I believe that. But have you ever truly said, hey, I believe in the resurrection of Christ to the point where I believe in that and that alone for eternal life? 
I believe in what he has done as the finished work on the cross. He was raised from the dead on the third day, and he now lives. And I believe in Jesus and what he actually said, that he is the resurrection and the life. Just think, if you do not really, really believe in that, then you're never going to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead so that thou shalt be saved, as it says in Romans chapter number 2. Excuse me, number 10. It says that. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved because you're believing in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're believing in his work that he did and how he was raised from the dead. In fact, the resurrection is so powerful and so meaningful that the first two sermons preached after Pentecost were not about the forgiveness of sin. It says up on the screen, the first two sermons preached after Pentecost in Acts 2 and Acts 3 focused on the resurrection of Christ not the forgiveness of sin. Think about that. Very simply, right out in front of you, that the resurrection of Christ was the paramount centerpiece of Peter's preaching in the gospel. You don't believe me? Go look it up. It's there. Thousands were saved. Thousands came to Christ and believed in the resurrection. What effects are there of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? What are the effects and what he accomplished as the resurrected God of the universe? We see Christ's divinity. We see Christ's deity. It says in Romans 1, and declared to be the Son of God with power, Paul wrote to the Romans, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Paul believed in Christ's divinity. Paul believed in the deity of Christ. Paul is writing this to the church at Corinth. And so the ramification or the effects of his resurrection are real. It also, in that resurrection, assures us that Christ has made an end of sin. So when you believe in that resurrection, as we preached through last week, kind of a little review, but kind of kicking us toward these next 20-something verses to finish out chapter 15, think about what it's saying up there. Just stop. It assures us that Christ has made an end of sin. He finished the captivity of sin in your life when you believe on the name of the Son of God. He led captivity captive. He took all sin upon him. He finished the transgression. He made reconciliation for iniquity. And as it says in Romans chapter number 3, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. That is it. God did it all through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his resurrection assures us that he has made an end of sin. So why are we stuck in sin? Why are we stuck? Because we've chosen to be. We've really chosen to be. I have chosen to be stuck living in the place of being captivated by the lost, sinful ways that I live. I'm born again, I'm saved. I still have flesh that has a decision to make constantly. But I make that decision, and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ said, hey, my will is going to line up with God's will. We were teaching yesterday in our Happy Five Soccer Club break time, let us pray, teach us to pray. Hey, God, we want to learn how to pray. So that's our break time theme. Teach us to pray. The little kids were asked by their coaches, hey, what are some things you can say about God? What are some wonderful things that you can say to tell him when you pray to him? And one of them is that he is glorious, that he is holy, that he is forgiven, that he is the redeemer. He has done all the work. And through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who he raised from the dead, Jesus shows us that he put an end to transgression. The Bible teaches us this. It's right there in Scripture. The resurrection assures us that Christ, beyond deity and beyond divinity, assures us that he has made an end of sin. Lastly, I just have up there another one that's at the end and comes to the end of chapter number 15. The resurrection also shows that he has procured or obtained victory over death and the grave. It says it there. It's up in Scripture right there. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I wonder if we're so used to hearing some of these type of verses at funerals or tough days and tough times, maybe at a visitation time and someone reads some passages for comfort to people because the person that has taken their last breath and truly was born again, they had a life of faith, and you know that, that for the comfort of those that are there, you say, hey, you know what? Death did not trap this person. They, it has no sting in their lives. Paul is saying, the grave doesn't have any victory. And I think to myself, if that's, well, that sounds really good. I know I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, everything's good. But in the meantime, between Salvation Day and the day that you take your last breath, you don't live in a place of being excited about your resurrection. You don't live in a place of being born again and saved and saying, hey, I can live a resurrected life. In fact, this resurrection that Jesus Christ is credited with in these verses here puts us me in a place. Remember, chapter 15, verse 19 if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And as we used that verse last week to really say, hey, if just Jesus Christ was a nice guy, he was a wonderful man, he might have had some good godly you know, character traits and, and, and some of the religions and cults that teach, well, he really wasn't God, he wasn't really divinity, and he really, I mean, he may have paid for sin, maybe, his sacrificial blood, but truly... He died as in the grave like everybody else. He, didn't be raised, he wasn't raised from the dead. Maybe Bible believers live that way because now, for some reason, you're not on that place of really answering for your faith. How many people really know that you're born again? How many people really know that you are resurrected in Christ. You're buried in the likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. How many people know that when you take your last breath that you will be in the presence of the Lord? And that at one day when the resurrection comes that you'll have a new body like the scriptures teach. That it will no longer be a mortal body but an immortal body. That it will not be bound by the flesh and the blood of this awful, awful house that is, has a propensity to be drawn to sin. In fact, is it possible that maybe just today, for a few moments, God would be allowed to speak to you and me, and we would really lay hold and take hold of our resurrection? That's our simple title of our message. To take hold of our resurrection because the resurrection is in Jesus Christ. The resurrection is of Christ. He is raised from the dead. But you, as a believer, will be raised from the dead. Five of you may know that. But we're going to study the scripture this morning and have you know by scripture it is true. And that maybe I would take hold of the resurrection today and live that way. That truly a born-again believer would say... Hey, I have a resurrected life to live. One day I'm going to be in his presence. Yes, of course, by how the spirit and soul leave. Our flesh goes into the grave, but the body will be raised one day. It will be changed to a glorious body, the scriptures teach. Again, the terrestrial cannot inhabit the celestial unless it's been changed. And you and I will be changed so that whatever body it is, and surely it's not going to look like this anymore. But it's going to look like something different. The scripture doesn't give complete detail, but I will tell you by studying this here together today, it should push you and I to lay hold and take hold of the resurrection that one day we will have with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is pushing at the church in Corinth. Well, let's study this through. We've got four simple lesson points. Let's take them one at a time, and we'll be done as the Spirit of the Lord directs us and shows us. Pick up with me in your passage of Scripture, verse number 35, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I will read down through 
this to verse number from 35 down through verse number 38. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Basically, Paul's saying, hey, there's somebody that's going to ask a good question. Are you that person that likes to ask good questions? Or just ask a question? That's what Paul's saying. These are good questions. Questions are good. Verse number 36. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. Verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him into every seed his own body. Think of what is being said here in God's beautiful nature, not mother's nature, God's nature. He says, I'm relating something here in my scripture about dying, being like a seed that is buried so that it will produce something that is a grain of wheat. In fact, up on the screen, our first lesson point says simply this. God's method for our resurrection is illustrated by the reproductive power of God's nature in seed. Consider again. Think. It's the springtime. Everybody wants to get the flowers going. Right? Anybody go cover their flowers today or last night just in case they were going to get a little cold? Did you? They might be frozen. Good job. Maybe they got a little frost on the pumpkin this morning. It was about 34, 35. I don't think it got quite down to freezing. I usually like to try and cover the grass out there at ADP Sports Park. Justin knows what I mean. You just like to put a sheet over it. There's six acres out there. You don't want it to get hurt. You're laughing. I was out there last night covering it. I had tarps and everything. Just kidding. But consider this. A tulip was put in the ground. You look at it, eh, it's a little ugly. Put a bulb in there. My mom used to plant bulbs all the time. Tulips, marigolds, things like that. And you are counting on them to come up and look a whole lot different than they did in that decomposed seedling. Think of what Jesus Christ taught us in John chapter number 12. You can write this down for a reference. I do not have it up on the screen. But he said in John 12, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. John 12, 24. It abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Hmm. Hmm. There are some good questions in there. And these questions point to someone that's saying, hey, I need to have an explanation for my faith in the Lord. I have to have some type of reasonable thinking here about faith. God doesn't say, okay, just follow me blindly. You can ask God questions and he'll answer them from your scriptures. Every word here is beautiful and perfect to answer your questions. In fact, verse 34 tells this to me in the context leading into this next section. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He's speaking to the Corinthian church about how some people don't have knowledge of God because they haven't talked to them about the knowledge of God. And they may not know some things. Well, ask some questions. But even there he's saying, hey, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Let's get a principle going here. In order for you to produce some wheat, you need to put some seedlings in the ground, and those seedlings are decomposed, formerly living parts of wheat. They're buds that dried out. You see, that decayed kernel, that deep composition, turns into a beautiful green slender little blade and it starts out that way full of life then it comes up out of the dirt and then you water it and you care for it it shoots up and it goes after the sunlight because it wants the sun and the nutrients nutrients and then when the water comes the roots go after the water that's in the ground it's just god's way and God's using that in a powerful way to show us that the body must die to bear fruit of another body. 
You will never have an eternal body that meets the Lord in the air one day. Unless you die. It's explained here. We'll go a little further in a moment. This body is corruption. But the new body is incorruptible. It must die in Jesus. So the beautiful part about the Romans doctrinal a basket full is that you are buried in the likeness of Christ that raised in the likeness of his re re resurrection. You are quickened in Jesus Christ and made alive. Before that, you were dead in your trespasses, uh, Galatians chapter number 2, and you're thinking, okay, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave what? For me. He gave it for gave it all. He gave it all for you and me. You say this is duh doctrine 101. Then why would we not live like it? I'm having a tough day. Sure you are. Tough week. Sure you are. But this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. That's a good way to live. Now it takes a while. You've got to stay with it. you got to stay with it. Well, I'm just going to ditch it and whatever. You're born again. You have a new life in Christ. New creature. I don't know if we quite grasp the ramifications of the doctrine of 2 Corinthians. But when you were reconciled to Christ, he said, hey... Die to yourself daily? Well, he even says, I die daily. But what Paul's basically saying in the context of that is not just the spiritual side of it that we use. We'd rather, hey, I'm dying every day. But I can't wait to be with him because then I'll be alive. But I'm alive right now, so I live like I'm alive. But I know my physical flesh is dying every day. You don't tell that to little kids, though, that are playing soccer. I had to... Referee, I had to be a field supervisor on the nine-year-olds. They're probably never going to let me again. I don't know. But we had a fun time. I didn't want them to be cold, so they usually play five-on-five five plus a goal. I said, let's do six-on-six six plus a goal. Seven-on-seven. Seven. Just keep them. And so they had, like, the scrum, everything. They had the ball. They, they were looking like five-year-olds. But they were sure warm. <laughs> what was the point in all of that? That the children, in response to some direction, were saying, okay, this can be a little bit more lively. This can be more of just being blah, cold, whining. Now think of your spiritual life being resurrected in Christ. Oh, the day is tough. My day is windy. It's stormy. It's rough. It's nasty. Hey, do you know that God's method of resurrection and being illustrated by the reduct the reproductive power of God's nature and seed allows you to say, whew, I'm new in Christ. I've got the day before me. There's no such thing as a really bad day, even though there are really bad days. Because when I take my last breath, I know by the doctrine of the word of God that I'll be in the presence of the Lord and a spiritual side of things. And then one day, whoo, I'm going to have a resurrection, a resurrected body. It's going to be different. That's powerful. Second, let's grab another pair, a bunch of verses. Let's go in verse number 39 through verse number 44, our second lesson point. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. Not too complicated, right? None of you look in here like a giraffe. You have a different flesh makeup. He made you a certain way on purpose. Verse number 40. There are also terrest excuse me, celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. God's saying the body he's made for you to operate here in the terra firma, in the terrain, in the terrestrial, it's his glory. He made you for his glory. He made the birds, the fish, everything for his glory. 
but also to the body that he will make for you celestial one day, that will be for his glory as well too, okay? So we're tracking the scriptures of what Paul is saying. Pick it up and continue in verse number 41, 42. Here's the, here he's saying, there is one glory of the sun, another the glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. It's all for his glory. That's his creation. He's saying, I've made all things a certain way for a certain reason. He's also making this new body for you for a reason. Here's verse 42 down through verse 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead relating to that. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Great doctrine. Great truth. This is the spiritual aspect of things when it comes to being born again. Or not being born again. So it says up on the screen in our second lesson point, God and his explanation of our resurrection shows the deep, deep contrast between the natural body and the spiritual body. There is a huge contrast. And I would say that when you look at this passage in this grasping 39 through 44, it was that we saw that that seed illustration was powerful. Here we see the spiritual side of things and we relate it to our resurrection, our resurrection in Jesus. Remember, he is raised from the dead. And when you believe in Christ, we are raised from the dead. When you walk through these verses, very simply, let's, let's just grab verse 42. You see something crazy here. It shows you something about you and me in this body. So also the resurrection of the dead is sown in corruption, is raised in incorruption. There's not a whole lot of durability in this body. Alan just left. I was going to use him as an example. Alan Scott told me yesterday he had his little cane. I said, I'm going to take that cane. No, 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 you can't take that cane from me. I was going over to eat somewhere, and, and I almost fell, but I had the cane, and it caught me. I said, well, maybe God was telling you not to go to Culver's. He loves Culver's. If, if you want to be a, give a treat to Alan, you give him Culver's. But in the incorruptible, in the resurrection, in that body, it will be so durable. It will last for all of eternity in the presence of the Lord. That's why this world wants to duplicate what God has for us, spiritually speaking. This is a spiritual matter. The natural body versus the spiritual body. Verse number 43 talks about the value and the ability of it. This contrast shows you in verse number 43, dishonor it is sown in. But it's raised in glory. That's hugely clear to me the longer I live. That verse is telling me that, guess what? My value as a fallen man that needed Jesus Christ was filled with dishonor against God. I came to know Jesus Christ and say, and as my Savior, and now he put all the value I could possibly want through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not true? All the value, all the potential, all that you could be is found in him. Paul said in Philippians 3, For our conversations in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, our dishonorable body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's beautiful. That's incredible. It's a spiritual matter. Again, this world wants to come up with all kinds of sci-fi shows that show you that, hey, we can just tr transition you, just flip you around from a natural to an unnatural, to a, to a spiritual. You can be, guess what? You can be an a extraterrestrial. You can be a celestial being. In fact, do they still have that cryo state thing where you can be frozen and then come back sometime like Walt Disney? What a disappointment he's going to have. 
And you already got the disappointment. In verse number 44, just to give you another realization, sown in the natural, back to the spiritual, there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. In your realm of existence right now, you are again trapped. I am trapped in this body and it's a natural body. But consider in Christ, in this beautiful word, with the Holy Spirit that's in you as a believer in Christ, your realm of existence is totally different than the lost person. Maybe you're lost today. And you don't have this essence or sense that you really have this incredible value and ability in the Lord because you've never called on the name of the Lord. You say that resurrection of Christ sounds like a good churchy type of thing, but you've never really called on the name of the Lord to save you as I talked of earlier. Then guess what? Your realm of existence is trapped to this and this alone. Our bodies already are strictly natural. They're limited. They're bound by natural laws of science and everything else. But the spiritual side of things is that as much as I'm inadequate in this, I'm completely capable of anything in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the ability to pray to the God of the universe because Jesus Christ raised from the dead. I can ask and talk and converse with him and tell him things that I would never tell any of you. And he never has broken my confidence. He's never let me down. He's always there. And guess what? He'll return the, the dialogue by talking back to me. I open up the word of God and he says, I am faithful. And I will suffer you to be tempted above you are able, but with the temptation I'll make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You can trust in me with all your heart. You don't have to lean on your own understandings. And all I ways acknowledge me and I'll direct your path. Delight in me. Delight thyself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart, Mark. But if you delight in your own stuff, you'll get exactly what you delight in. The realm of my existence as a born-again person still is trapped in this flesh. The realm of your existence, if you're lost today and you're not born again, you're not a new creature in Christ, then you are trapped forever. And when there is a resurrection one day, your resurrected body will put you right in a place called the white throne judgment. And then the Lord will look for your name in the book of life. And whoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And that will be the resurrected state of a lost person. My resurrected state because of Jesus Christ is going to be with him. You're born again. You're going to be with him. You're going to be immortal. You're going to be eternal. That's what Paul's telling them. Why would you not tell everybody how to get saved? He's continuing with a simple explanation of what these seed illustrations work in this life of being planted in him work. The last couple. Let's pick it up in verse number 45. And let me read down with 45 through 50. It'll be the next, one, last, next to the last one. Here you go. 45. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Remember, very simply, in the flesh, Adam represents first man. Everything in a lost state, that's what we were before Jesus Christ. The second is Jesus Christ. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. If you have a translation that does not have that in there, I would not be surprised. There's many that remove that text. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's the Lord. He's from heaven. Verse number 48 tells me, reiterating it, as is the earthy, such are also they that are earthy. That's an Adam. If you're only an Adam and you're not in Christ, that's what you've got. And as it is the heavenly, such as are they that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 
that's, that's doctrine. That's the truth. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He has to change the body to completely fulfill the kingdom of God one day. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. And we shall be all changed. It says up there, in the eternal side of things, God's necessity for our resurrection bodily. And he has to keep on reiterating. He reiterates the fact that this corruptible flesh is not fitted for eternity. It's just not. Very simply, the explanation goes right there, just like this. The fact of the matter is that this fragile, broken flesh is not suited and fitted, and so God will make it suited and fitted for all of eternity. We're fragile in our flesh, we're flag fragile in our blood, our flesh and blood. This corpse, it's not, it doesn't fit eternity. And because of what Jesus Christ has done, we have this celestial future in him, with him. And the resurrection of Christ gives us a new body to fit that. That's what the scripture is saying. This world is stuck on the first man. The world that is really capturing people's hearts and minds and souls. It's even having way too much effect on the born-again believer who should be living in the resurrected life. You say, you, again, you don't know how tough life is. It doesn't matter. If you take that to God the Father in heaven and you say, you have no idea how tough my life is. What's he going to say? Why don't you open up my scripture? They led away my son to the slaughter. They beat him for you. He bloodied, he was bloodied for you. And he's been raised from the dead and he's taken care of sin and you've been reconciled to me, holy God, through my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't tell me about your tough day. Now, you could tell me it's okay. But telling God that? This is an eternal statement by Paul's words, by the Holy Spirit. It's God's word speaking, so it is written. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. In Jesus Christ, you were made alive. And now, you're not stuck worshiping that first man existence. And in order for you to really capture this, you must read that and say, Wow, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Born again believers, you are in the resurrection of Christ and one day in his presence you'll be bodily put together with all that you are in his entity. And as Brother Brian, Pastor Brian preached about just a few weeks ago, you will be in his presence. But guess what? The Bible says, and hath raised us together, Ephesians 2, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You preached this same message, brother, just a few weeks ago. I guess if the Holy Spirit's leading us through the passages of Scripture to do this, it must be significant for us. As God is reiterating his truth in his scripture that we are reading, God is reiterating it personally for us. We need to live like we are resurrected. We need to live in Christ alone. Again, whoever's in that state of having an awful difficult time in life, I get it and I understand it. I spend hours in counseling on a weekly basis with people. I get it. But you have a powerful, powerful thing in the resurrection of Christ. You have a spiritual life in Christ as his resurrection. You have this incredibly eternal perspective. And lastly, you've got a doctrinal truth that cannot be moved. Verse number 51, follow out as we finish this chapter. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. We're talking of rapture, then we're talking about second coming, we're talking about the end of the way we know life as it is, and here we are. Paul speaking about it in 56, 57, 58 A.D. Getting the church people ready for one day. Verse 53 says, for this corruptible must put on, must put on in corruption. He's going to do that, believer. And this mortal must put on immortality. He's going to do that, believer. So when this corruptible shall put on, have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be written to pass the saying that is written, brought to pass, the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. Think again about the clarity of what is being written in the scriptures. The issue is death. The issue is sin. The issue is the law. And they do not have power over you. In Jesus Christ, he says, victory is won. Verse 57, but thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is the life that we have in Christ and powerfully speaking, this resurrection in Christ tells you that you are going to have a resurrection one day. And you will be that immortal, eternal, incorruptible vessel in glory with the Savior, with the God of the universe. How about if we woke up every morning like that? It might be pretty good. How about if we went to bed like that? I heard there was a man named Daniel who got trapped in a lion's den. Oh, yeah. The grandchildren love that one. You know why? Because those boys were protected in the fiery furnace, and he was protected from the lion that could eat him. He was living in an eternal place, communicating with the God of glory. Oh, you need to worship the king. I already have a king to worship. That was Daniel. It says up on the screen there, God's declaration about our resurrection is because of the victory of Jesus Christ in his own resurrection. I've been saying it all the way through. What is it that you have that didn't come from him? What is it that you're holding that he did not give to you? What is it in the salvation that he procured for you and obtained for you and for me. What is it? You see, God's declaration about the resurrection is because of the victory that's already won. Some will say, well, that's just God speak. That's just, just kind of lessening the defeatist attitude of life that I have. You're mixed up. You need more of the word of God. You need to learn that he has something in you. It's the name of Jesus and the Savior. He has something for you in his word. He has truth. He has doctrine. He has life principles, answers to every single question for you. And the ones where you think, I'm going to find a question to stump the Lord, then you can ask him later when you have that incorruptible body. And by the way, why would you try and stump the one that saved your soul? Why would you go down that road of being so antagonistic that you would want to turn the glory and grace and love of his salvation of Jesus and the resurrection into something that would be twisted and perverted? That way of a devilish move. How about if I just open up the scriptures and go, wow. Death. All the death that we've been through together. Everybody in this room, a hundred and something people. A bunch of people, all people. Three, four hundred people come to church. Everybody, I'm sure, has experienced death in some form or fashion. All the death. It's swallowed up in victory in the believer's life. Swallowed up. Eaten by him. 
dismissed by him. Oh, death, where is thy sting? There's no sting in death anymore for the believer. Grave, can't hold you. <laughs> can't hold me. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, that I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Verse 57, but thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For our prayer time today as we finish up, without belief in the resurrection, salvation cannot be received. Maybe, maybe you just don't believe. You believe maybe again as a cerebral type of activity. I've used that term or not. Maybe, maybe it just hits you here and you go, but never have you believe in your heart you can confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus only for your salvation. You've never said, yeah, I hear that Jesus said that he's the resurrection and the life. I've never really made a move to really believe. Without the resurrection of Christ, there would be no salvation available. That's our victory in Jesus. Without believing in the resurrection, salvation, salvation cannot be received. Who needs to receive the truth today. Maybe you. Maybe you. I'll be up here after church service if you'd like to come and visit. I'll sit and talk with you all day, all night, answer every question from the scriptures. If there's more than one of you, I, I have many people that would love to sit with you. But for you, believer, I'll come back to you. I asked last week for you to pray for people. Today, who needs to receive the truth that you know? Maybe in this moment of time, God just brought it to life and brought it to light. And maybe today in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that you now know, hey, there's a resurrection for me too. Oh, yeah. Maybe I choose to live that life in Christ by the word of God. By the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that saved my soul. Would you please bow for a word of prayer as we close out and have some prayer time and invitation. Father in heaven, this is our time. It has been all along the way to respond to you, but even more specific, collectively and corporately. So in the name of Jesus, I pray that you'll work upon the hearts of every person. We will not be distracted by the next thing, but right now in this moment, grab a hold of the lives of the people that you truly are speaking to. Maybe it's every one of us. Maybe, truly, God, as we say to ourselves, Jesus, you said you're the resurrection and life. I, I need to live there. Maybe for the believers today, it'll be a turnaround where the believer will now live in a place of the resurrected life. God, we have victory in your son, Jesus. May you have your way in this time. In your name we pray. Please stand.